Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So tonight we'll be going through Faith is the Victory. Uh, I really like this song. I just like the messaging in it, the melody of it. It's one that I've always gravitated towards when I was leading. It's one of my go-tos that wasn't on the list for Adam singing. Uh, so uh, I've always liked it, so I figured learning more about it is a good thing to do. And I did that, so I'm hoping to share some of those things with you today. Um, one thing I found in my research, I guess you can call it research for this class, uh, I came along a website uh, and it had five different things that a hymn should be. So I'm gonna run through those and we can think about those things as we go through this class. Uh, the first one is a hymn should be truthful. Uh, it should express the truth of God's word clearly and accurately and also be true to human experience. If a song is doctrally in error or spiritually unrealistic, that is a major flaw. It should be devotional. Uh, it should be devotionally appealing with a warmth of feeling that strikes a responsive chord in the heart. A hymn should be universal. Great hymns are able to span generations and cultures. They have a timelessness that ministers to a wide audience. So probably a hymn about COVID wouldn't work, but a hymn about struggling in uh, a situation probably would. Uh, a hymn should be poetical. It should be of high literary quality, full of memorable phrases, richly vivid and insightful. And the wording should be appropriate, worthy of the sacredness and importance of its subject. And finally, a hymn should be singable. Though they can often be simply read with profit, Hymns are intended to be sung. That means the words need to be wedded to a tune that is skillful, suitable, and singable. But there are some fine tunes that don't suit the text they are put with. The tune must act like the frame of a picture, supporting and enhancing the message of the words. So I liked all of those. All of them seem to really fit with things that, when you think about hymns that you like sort of fit into that mold. So um, just keep those in the back of your mind. We're going to revisit this at the very end and see how this hymn sort of stacks up to all of those things. So uh, just take a note of that in your head and think about those things. So introduction to the song, like I said, it's Faith is the Victory. Uh, it was written by John Henry Yates. There he is. He's much better at growing beards than he is knowing where the camera is. Um, he was born in 1837 in Batavia, New York. His mother was a school teacher who loved poetry and literature, and his father was a shoemaker and a traveling temperance lecturer, which I didn't know was a thing, um, but I guess at that time it definitely was. Um, in, so if, if you're um, a parent that has an accident-prone child, uh, this is probably a story for you that they can make it through. They probably won't die. And hopefully you don't have any situations as severe as uh, what happened to him. In 1844, he fell off a high set of stone steps in a hotel and tumbled down into a cellar and fractured his skull. Um, so he was unconscious for a long time and they weren't sure if he was going to wake up. Uh, you probably noticed the huge gap in his hair. That's actually a scar from that fall. So uh, that wasn't the only thing. Uh, in 1847, three years later, uh, his family was traveling by ship and a storm struck the ship and he was flung across the deck and broke his leg. And then when he was 16, he was in a play and pierced his lung when he accidentally fell on a knife. So um, he was on the brink of death for three weeks as he recovered from that. So like I said, accident prone. I thought I was accident prone as a child when I like tripped a lot and needed a few stitches every now and again. This is next level type of stuff. Uh, hopefully Benji won't be like that, but uh, we will see. Um, and unfortunately, uh, when in, in 1878, his wife and two children died from a diphtheria outbreak. Um, so he, he went through some, a lot of things in his life. So looking at the song through the lens of this guy that has been through so much in his life and has 
overcome that with his faith is, is huge. And four years after that happened is when he wrote this song. So we will dive into that now. Um, first off, let's go ahead and read 1 John. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 is where the inspiration from this song comes from. Uh, we're going to read a little bit more than that. Uh, I will go ahead and read that as we go through. Welcome, high schoolers. 1 John 4.13 through 5.4. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So we are going to go ahead and sing this song. If you are in the book, it's number 515. It will also be on the screen up here. I'll take care of it. <laughs> Unless I forget, then you can hit the button. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. Impress the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory. the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Drawn up in dread array, let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about, the earth shall tremble neath the tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory. Faith is the 
victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, wide raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. So what are your first impressions of this song? We sang through it once. Uh, what are you guys thinking? What are some of the things that pop out to you just on a quick sing through? I think of faith being like a big flag flying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of the verses, his banner over us is love. So that's one of the, the themes where you think of in a battle, this banner flying. And we'll talk a little bit about that. What else? Either one. You can fight for He's it. He's extremely confident. He knows his faith. He assures it. It's not a, a weary statement. He's certain. Right. And you look at the author. You talk about battle-tested. That's, uh, that's the type of person that when you think about faith and trying to teach somebody faith, if anybody can do it, it's probably him, for sure. Pretty similar to that. Normally when we think of a battle, we think of a soldier gets a sword, goes into battle, and then he has the victory. But it's interesting that for Christians, we have the victory, and then we become soldiers of Christ, and then we go into battle. So it's sort of reverse. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And we can have that faith that regardless of what we do, we have Christ and we can overcome it. That's great. Jonathan? Um, I like how it draws together, like, it seems like the whole church and the church throughout history as well. It calls back on saints of old and then us as, as well today. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's one thing that, for me, I'll dive into it a little bit later, but is a huge encouragement because anytime you think about the trials you're going through, you kind of put it up there and you're like, oh man, no one has ever dealt with what I've dealt with and no one has ever made it through this. But uh, you can see that, yeah, people have, and uh, you can use that as an encouragement. Anything else? Ed? Um, it just, uh, in that second verse, you know, talking about the sword of the Lord of God, uh, each read, the roads of saints above, the shouts of triumph, those that have come before and were faithful and made it through death, to, until death. He did, yeah. Four years before writing the song, his wife and two children died. Definitely. Yeah, you, when, when you go through something like that, having a confidence that death isn't really the end and having a confidence that what we have overcomes even death is even more important. There's a sense to me that I'm not alone either. You know, we're all, you know, there's, there's definitely sort of a groundswell, sort of, you feel like you're part of the Lord's army when you're in the midst of singing the song, reading the lyrics, what have you, and uh, it's not just a personal struggle. You feel the support, you feel the iron and sharpening iron, all that kind of thing comes through here that I don't feel like I'm out there with my, you know, little cap gun trying to fight some 
mass army or something. Right. When you're up in a battle and it's just you out there on the battlefield and this, whatever the foe is that you're facing, it's a lot different than all of us there with you and everybody that's been there before. And uh, it makes it much easier to swallow and have that, uh, that confidence and that courage, for sure. Yes, yeah, Stacey. When, when you remember to give God glory just because you lived through something, um, then your faith is built up and your faith becomes the victory for going through those things and giving God the glory every time. Right. It's, I feel like I stop short there a lot. Uh, and I won't turn this into confession hour, but like you, you pray, something big's coming up. You pray and you pray and you pray and you pray, and then God answers that prayer and it happens, and then you're like, okay, cool, and you just go about your day. It's not, uh, it's not really a thank you. This is such a relief. This is, you know, to glorify you, and you know that that's something that I personally do a lot, where it's, um, you know, you forget really the strength that that God gave you and getting you through whatever it is you're facing. Do you have something, Dave? When you're, going, when you're singing this, you just feel the momentum. It's just forward, forward, forward. Yes. And they say, look, there it is, drawn up in dread array of the enemy. And then onward to the fray. It's like, bring it on. It's There it is. Let's go straight at it and mm -hmm. get head on. It's just, for me, singing this, and what I think, it's just empowering. Just a tsunami of yeah, that's that's one of the I didn't really know I felt it until sort of preparing for this. But this song, you very much feel like you're moving with the song and uh, songs are meant to build you up. And, uh, you know, we sing together to encourage one another. But uh, yeah, it, it feels like you're moving with the song. And after the song ends, you can just keep moving. <laughs> and it's, it's it's really nice to to have that feeling. And yeah, I see, I see that too. Kevin, do you have something? I was going to add, because I've been thinking, that was my first thought, actually, with, with, in regards to the music and what you and Dave were just saying about that moving forward, that it always stands out how complimentary the music is to the words, that it's very March-like. It sounds very yeah. futuristic. So it feels very steady and persistent. And, and when you hear that, I call those concepts with faith, that's what you want in faith, is to be steady and persistent no matter what you're facing and it keeps driving you forward. And I really like that about Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was going to bring that up uh, later when we go back through, but that's one of the big things that stuck out to me was just like the cadence of the of the song is just like a march and you're just going with it. So that's, that's great. Jonathan? Um, Steve Chetland writes, from the passage we read, we see that the battle that being fought is to love our brethren and to obey God, which we do not by our strength but by our faith. We only win when we trust Him. Yeah, and that's, that's something I've been, completely aside from any notes I have, I've been thinking personally a lot that you can do the same thing and you can accomplish the same thing and it could mean two separate things. So are you doing what you're doing for yourself or are you doing what you're doing to glorify God? Uh, you know, we're put here to do good works, but not to just do good works. We're here to do good works to bring God glory. So that's a, that's a great point. Anything else, Jamie? Uh, the part where it says, let tens of these be left behind, is probably my least favorite Christianity. Yes. <laughs> I just want to float on. <laughs> yes. I, wanna, I don't want to believe my small piece. Exactly. And it, it makes you think, is it too easy for me right now? And uh, we'll, we'll dive a little bit further into that. But um, anytime you're going through life and you think, wow, this is going really well and it's super easy and I am having a great time, you may not be doing everything the right way uh, in your Christian, your Christian walk. You may have slid a little too far into the world. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Anything else before we dive into the verses? All right. So verse 1, Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle, ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. 
Against the foe in veils below, let all of our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. So the wording here, it's a hill and we're soldiers on a hill pressing against a, a foe in the valley below. Um, so what do we know uh, about what the most advantageous place in a battlefield is? High ground, right? Um, this is something that uh, is not necessarily just a biblical concept. This um, Sun Tzu in the art of war, he who occupies the high ground will fight to advantage. Uh, this is something that, that we know. Um, and if you don't have the high ground, you're supposed to retreat and hopefully get them to chase you to where you can have the high ground again. That's uh, I guess battle 101. I never took that class, but uh, I imagine that's the first day. Um, so what are you drawn to in this verse specifically? I put my so, first note up there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's a call to action. Mm -hmm. I really like that, just spurring this on. Exactly. What else? Yes. I didn't have that note down, believe it or not, but yes. Um, Jake, your point, let's turn to James 1, 23 through 25. If someone could read that for us. Just go ahead and start when you find it. That's James 1, 23 to 25. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's, a, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I know for me personally, uh, if I hear something and don't do it right away, uh, Miranda, I'm sure will be nodding her head, uh, will, I'll just immediately forget it. It has to be done right this moment. So uh, I would be a, a hearer and not a doer unless I did it um, with some sort of urgency as well, uh, along with actually doing it. What else do we see in this verse? Definitely. Let's go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. So, always moving, dedicating your whole self to it using your entire self to move forward towards this cause. Uh, we also see in this verse that it is a battle that involves every single one of us. It is, um, this is sort of what Tim was hinting at earlier. It's not something that we do alone, and it's not something that we can sit on the sidelines and do. So if you would turn to Numbers 32. Numbers 32, and if I could get a volunteer to read verses 1 through 7. And there are some names in there, just be warned before you read. 
Yeah. The people of Reuben, the people of Gad, had a very great number of livestock. And they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place of livestock. So the people of Gad and the people of Reuben came and said to Moses and to Eleazar the priest, and to the chiefs of the congregation, Adora, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Delilah, Sheba, Nebo, and Beon, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel, is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. But Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over to the land that the Lord has given to them? So we don't have an option to just sit and let everybody else do the work. That's not something that we're allowed to do as a Christian. Um, we are to do this together as a group, um, like Tim was mentioning. And side effects of that is encouragement to one another. I know being in this building alone would be like being on a battlefield by myself, where I come here in the middle of the week, no one decided to show up, and I'm like, well, I guess I'll, I'll go home and play video games the rest of the night instead of being here and worshiping God and learning more about his word. Um, so you all being here is an encouragement to me, and it also gives me the strength to go through other trials that I may have in my life. So each person has that responsibility to not just uh, themselves to fight this battle, but to every one of, uh, everybody else in the room as well. So what does it look like in a Christian's life when we aren't dedicating ourselves entirely to this and maybe sitting on the sidelines? How does that manifest itself? Jake? I'm just thinking out loud here, but it, it, I think it comes to like a loose grip on holiness and righteousness. Like uh, if you're not fully invested and fully plugged in, your compass like gets in a little bit of a haze and you say like what might have before been a hard fast no soon becomes like a soft no and then a soft yes then a hard yes and so when you're not fully plugged in and surrounding you I mean you're the average of your five closest people we hear that all the time and so if your five closest people aren't pulling you you know to the Lord if you're not plugged in to the Lord and the Lord's people then soon you're going to fall by the wayside yeah, maybe I choose, oh, I'll just do this other thing on a Wednesday night. It's just a Wednesday. It's just a Bible study. It's not in the Bible. Like, I have to do it, right? Uh, and then, you know, it's just a Sunday night. Why do I have to come on Sunday night? It's a repeat of Sunday morning. Well, I mean, it's just one Sunday morning. Why do that? So it, it's, it's a slide. It, it, you get there slowly, and then you become the person sitting out. You become the person not fighting the battle anymore. Not only is this a war hymn, but it's also deeply about heaven. And I think, to Jake's point about holiness, if we surround ourselves with the things of the world and what's going on in our life right now in our job, and we forget about the promise of the resurrection, then we're not spiritually focused. I mean, could we imagine Paul at the end of his life writing to Timothy and not mentioning how excited he is for the crown of righteousness? I think absolutely we're singing this song to praise God, but a part of that is a hope for ourselves that we have a promise, that we have a reward waiting for us. And I think that can, can go alongside. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, Jonathan. Steve Chatlet writes, I think we can draw encouragement from the fact that this song recognizes that anything, every day, can be a struggle, a fight, a war. That means even small trust in him is important, even when the results seem small. Now that's that's a great point. That's that's another one that um, we'll hit later in one of the other verses as well. All right, let's go ahead and move on to verse two. His banner over us is love, our sword the word of God. We tread the road the saints before with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath, swept on or every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. So what sticks out to you about this verse? 
Adam. This one to me was very uh, Hebrews 11 adjacent. Like it's just yeah. talking about it's not uh, a road that no one's ever been down before, and we follow mm -hmm. in the footsteps of those who have gone on and take inspiration from their faith when we feel like we can't keep going anymore. For sure. Yeah, it's it's such an encouragement to. It's so weird to see other people suffer, I guess. Um, I, I don't want to say that, and if you're suffering, I'm sorry. Um, I don't get joy in that, but it's an encouragement seeing somebody go through that and be vulnerable and come out victorious and know that, hey, maybe I'm going through the same thing or I will go through the same thing, and I can have that faith that, that I can do that too. So what is a banner? We alluded to that earlier. Does anybody know what a banner is in a battle context? Flag. A flag. What does it represent? Well, it can mean many things. One, it can represent who you are, the, the mission you're from. It can also represent a call uh, to the soldiers. You know, when a certain flag is raised or how it's raised, it, it tells the army what to do. Um, it's a signal flag, but, it, but it's a and if nothing else, it's a message. No, that's perfect. I, I found, um, did someone say, have something? Yeah, go for it. I was just going to say, it's something that unites everybody. Perfect, yes. I found um, it's a rallying point or a proof of purpose of the group. It brings the cause together. This is what we're doing. Um, this is where we are uh, in Exodus 17:15. this is the, we won't turn there, um, but the, it's a verse that comes right after the story where Israel prevails while Moses' hands are raised, and um, he says after that, the Lord is my banner, and that's sort of what we're after. The Lord is our banner, and it, he's what unites us. Uh, we also learn that the word of God is to be our weapon in this battle. So how do we use the word of God like a weapon? Let's go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 3. If someone can read verses 14 through 17. As for you, continue in what you have learned. Firmly believe, knowing from whom you learn, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's a pretty versatile weapon, isn't it? It's it can be used for a lot of different things in the, the battle that we're fighting. Um, so like we talked about, we're going down a path that others have gone down and been victorious. Um, one of my favorite examples um, is the stoning of Stephen. Uh, after he gives his speech to the council, uh, he, instead of being super angry that people are stoning him, which I think would be a pretty reasonable response, um, he asked the Lord to forgive them. So not only does he make it to the end, and not only does he ask them to forgive them, but he does it with seemingly a smile on his face, like, hey, I've done this. I'm victorious. You can't hurt me physically because of what I have faith in. And then, uh, as we've expressed as well, the faith that others have used for victory is still our shield today. So that faith that Stephen had back then is still what the same faith that we're using today to win the battles that we're in. Let's go ahead and move on to verse 3. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array, let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about, the earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. So what sticks out to you about this verse? Yeah. I, I think one of the great parts about this class is we get to talk about so many different hymns. And I don't think I could give a greater comment than 
um, a verse from this complimentary hymn to the song, mm -hmm. talking about the early saints and the steadfastness and their triumph and, and Christ being the word of God. And so this is from 521. It reads, the early saints held fast indeed, and one would soon reward them. For mounted on his battle steed, the word of God came toward them. And though the slaughter glorious, his army rode victorious. Their cause, now aged two thousand years, is still the cause before us. So it brings in that idea of, I love your point of Stephen at the very end, that these very early saints, and our goal is to keep some sort of consistency, if we can, yeah. uh, with their standard. It's tough to do. I, I mean, I get angry. I'm, I'm not even that angry of a person. Uh, but I, I get angry in like the littlest situations, and I've never once been attempted to be stoned, but I don't imagine I would be very happy in that situation, regardless of what got me there. What else do you guys see in this verse? It's almost like the first two verses, you're getting pumped up in the locker room, and you're just like, it's game time, all right, let's go. And then like, you get out in the field, and everybody's three times your size, and there's like 300 of them, and you're like, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, in the song, we're encouraging each other to take up the fight, and so it does start with, remember, we're like an army, but then it's also one of the other ways of encouraging us to say, remember, there's a serious enemy out there. Like We can't afford to hang back, and that's what Paul does in Ephesians 6. Is he actually highlights we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the forces of this present darkness. And he outlines how scary the enemy is. He doesn't brush over it, and he says that you know, one, it's going to be God, and then two, it's going to be all hands on deck to help in that fight. Yeah, definitely. And a ton of the words in this lyrics in this song come from Ephesians six too. So yeah, Brian. With Adam's thought. Um, the first part there, um, on every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. So the enemy is all around us and he's terrifying. And the thing that's scary about the world, and I think myself, Christians, and the world that we live in, is so often we don't even recognize the enemy. Like, we're surrounded by this enemy, and the dread array, he's just, he's terrifying, and, and we have no idea. Like, we don't call attention to it, or recognize it, and then that draws me to the Salvation's Helmet, but then it says, the thing that we're clothed with all over our bodies is truth. And I just think about, like, my news feed, and social media, and how fast people throw around the word evil. That's evil. And they say things like, this is immoral. And it's, it seems, every time I see that word, it's like, you have no standard or idea what is really evil. You're just throwing words around. Yeah. And that's the scary part to me. It's like, I think step one is to realize we're surrounded by the enemy and to be scared of it. And then to confront that enemy with truth. One of the scary things about that proposition is really seeing churches sort of shift with society and seeing that those outside things that we don't see as enemies just start seeping in and the church is moving. But like you said, that truth hasn't changed and the church shouldn't change with society. It should remain unmoved. All right, let's go ahead and skip to verse four. I told a couple of people, this is my first time teaching an adult class, and I either had way too much information or way too little information. I erred on the too much information. So uh, verse 4, to him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. 
So what sticks out to you from that one? It's kind of nice, isn't it? It's, uh, it's the culmination. It's, OK, we were pumped up in the locker room. We faced this super scary thing. And now we can breathe. And it's, it's nice to see that. Tim? One word that stands out in this verse to me is love. What happens with most of our wonderful wars and everything throughout history? It's a ruthless takeover. It's Alexander the Great. It's, Stalin, it's Hitler, it's all these kinds of things that, you know, per, you know, rightfully give war a bad name. Mm -hmm. But this is a different kind of war. Uh, but we're not ruthless victors. We're not to stomp on skulls and all that kind of thing. It's with love of flame, and it is. We're casting, you know, Jesus cast out the night, and and uh, this is what it's about. It's it's. Love is what should really be driving us more than anything, not some ruthless thing to say, ah, I told you so, I was right, you're wrong. It's about love. I was wondering how I was going to skip a huge chunk of what I had and tie it into the very last thing I wanted to say. So thank you for the perfect segue. Let's turn to Romans 8. Romans 8, and I'll read verses 37 through 39. Romans 8, 37 through 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the faith that we have that makes us victorious is only possible through the love that God showed us in sending his son to die for us. And we can take courage in the fact that nothing can happen during this battle and nothing in this life can affect that in the slightest. Uh, nothing can separate us from that love that, that God's shown us. Um, so is there anything from that list that we went through of the song? It should be, let me find it here. It should be truthful, devotional, universal, poetical, and singable. Is there anything from that that really stuck out to you? I know we talked a little bit about the singability of it with it sounded almost like a marching cadence, uh, and you really felt like you were moving with the song. Yeah? There's a lot of universality, as we've talked about, not just with other Christians on this earth, but also the fellowship we have with all the saints of the past. Right. It's... It's unmovable. You know, it's, it doesn't change. It's something that we can always relate to each other. And it's something that anything, any battles that I'm fighting, someone else may take courage from that 100 years down the line. I don't know how that would happen, but uh, it, it may be there. So thank you, everybody, for the participation and uh, for following along with me.